Hello and welcome to Success Magazine's Success CD. This is the exclusive bonus audio we provide free in every issue of Success Magazine. My name is Darren Hardy, and I'm the publisher of Success. In this issue of Success, we're addressing innovation and change. I was recently asked to be on a panel with four other experts in the publishing industry. The burning question of the session was, how has innovation changed the publishing industry? You could feel the audience nervously shift in their seats. They knew this was a sensitive and wound-filled topic. The print media moguls who once dominated the global newsstands were now being walloped from every direction by digital and technological innovations. To prove their innovativeness, each quote-unquote expert gave their best bleeding-edge answer. On-demand printing is the wave of the future, the first one cried. E-books interrupted the second one. E-books are what turned our industry upside down. And still another went on a social media rant that was no doubt tweeted and retweeted a hundred times from the room. The world of publishing as we know it has forever changed, the fourth expert stated with a profound and slightly ominous tone. And then it was my turn to speak. With all eyes on me, I took a deep breath and said the one thing no one expected. More has not changed then changed. There was a slight gasp from the audience, and I could feel the other panelists shocked and angry stares on my back. But I continued, people are getting caught up in chasing the change and forgetting what this business is actually about. People. I wasn't being cute. It's true. While technology has changed and evolved dramatically, people haven't. People still have worries, fears, desires, hopes, and great ambitions. They want to be moved, validated, cared for, and respected. It doesn't matter the technology, platform, or medium through which you reach them. People are still people. And as Peter Diamandis said, humans haven't had a software update in 200,000 years. As the moderator thanked us for participating and we were ushered off stage, I couldn't stop thinking about that question and the mistake that so many of us are making. Too often, we hold out hope that technology or innovation is going to be the breakthrough for our business, that one more gadget or widget or app is going to make the difference. And of course, the telephone, fax machine, email, social media, and the like all did incredible things to improve our ability to reach more people but none of them guarantee that you actually reach people. None of them guarantee that you will connect with people, move them, and affect them. That's done through the message and the content of what you are delivering through that technology. Technology will continue to evolve and innovate rapidly. Human emotions and human needs will not. Remember that fact. It's the base essence of every business and it's a constant. Certainly, you should stay up on the ways to improve, innovate, and iterate on your processes, manufacturing, productivity, and channels of communication. And this is an excellent issue that will help you do just that. But don't get so caught up in what's new, shiny, and innovative that you forget what's on the receiving end of every one of those innovations. A wonderful, beautiful, needy, and hopeful human being looking to improve their very human experience and life. And that will never change. On this issue of the Success Magazine CD, you will listen in as I interview two renowned experts on the topic of change and innovation. Then at the end, I will give you eight practical ways you can integrate continual innovation into your business regardless of your product, service, marketplace, or whether you have thousands of employees or whether you are still a guy or a gal starting up in your garage. Because if there's one thing sure about the future, it is that it will be very different from the present. And to keep up, you're going to have to continually innovate and fast. I will summarize and detail how at the end. So, let's get started. Are you ready? If you're ready, say... I'm ready. Okay. And know, as always, that you can count on success to be your most important resource to inspire, inform, and improve your life. Welcome to success.
For true innovation, you need human interaction, conflict, argument, and debate. These are the words of Margaret Heffernan, entrepreneur and CEO. Margaret had it right. Innovation isn't something we accomplished on our own. We need to discuss and debate in order to learn and, more importantly, to innovate. To encourage our human interaction in order to amp up our innovation, I asked Linda Hill to come in and speak with us. Linda is the Wallace Brett Dunham Professor of Business Administration at Harvard Business School, and she is the faculty chair of the Leadership Initiative and author of several books, including the recent success, Collective Genius, The Art and Practice of Leading Innovation. It features descriptions of exceptional leaders of innovation from a wide range of industries that we can learn a lot from when it comes to our own innovative efforts. Linda, welcome to success. Great to have you here today. Pleasure to be with you. So, Linda, I want our listeners to have a clear picture of what innovation looks like as we delve deeper into the hows as we talk today. So share a few of your best examples of organizations and their innovative practices so that we can keep them in mind as we go along here. We've studied leaders in a range of industries all around the world. One of the industries that we've looked at a lot is entertainment. So we have studied, for instance, Pixar since 2004. And I think we'd all say that Pixar is indeed a very innovative organization. And we looked at the founder of Pixar as he has actually led that that organization. We've also studied Google since its very early days. The person we studied was, I think, employee number nine as he was building that website and scaling it at the pace necessary. We also studied eBay very early on. In the, actually the first 10 years of, of eBay and how they innovated, particularly eBay Germany, which was considered to be the most innovative piece of eBay. And of course, eBay was a pioneer that has changed the way we all shop now. We've also studied an IT outsourcing company from India, and this company has been able to get the very frontline employees to produce all kinds of innovative solutions for their clients. Just to give one example, one 26-year-old came up with a $15 million savings for a client based on his set of ideas that he realized would help the client organization be much more successful and reduce their costs. Okay, so I'm going to ask you as we go along here to explain how they do that, encourage and foster that kind of culture. But first off, I just want to kind of dispel some of the myths or amplify some of the truths. Most people see innovation as this sort of chance occurrence, right? A flash insight. Talk about the truth or the falsehood behind this idea and how we can avoid having this type of innovation be the only one that we aspire to. Actually, that kind of innovation very, very rarely happens. It's really a myth, this idea of some individual having an aha moment. That is not the way the majority of innovation happens. Even when you look at an individual who's been very creative and very innovative, it turns out that you have to understand the social context he or she was in to really appreciate why they were able to innovate. So most innovation requires really diversity and conflict. Very hard to get innovation without that. And so you need at least, if you will, two people to have that kind of diversity and conflict. So let me define innovation for you. First, innovation is about that which is new and useful. And when you try to get the new, what you need to do is really unleash lots of ideas. And then to get the useful, you have to figure out how to leverage and harness those ideas, deal with the diversity and conflict that comes from that to come up with a useful solution that will be for the collective good. So really, it's, it's just a myth. There's not, not much innovation that actually happens you know, by an individual. And very rarely are these ideas full-blown. They usually are really discovered through dis- what is referred to as discovery-driven learning. So before we move on, I want to get clear on the two key points that you made there. So first off is to collect a lot of ideas. So get a lot of ideas up on the board. And the next one is to deal with the conflict of people who have ownership of their idea over another one. So just to explain your ways of encouraging both of those, lots of ideas, and then what are a couple of suggestions on dealing with conflict post the ideas being thrown up at the board and vetting them down? Well, let me just step back a bit. So if an innovation is something that's both new and useful, what you need to do is basically amplify the differences and then, again, leverage those for the collective good or to come up with a solution. So what you see is a really basic capability of organizations that can innovate time and again is something we refer to as creative abrasion. Creative abrasion is being able to create a marketplace of ideas through debate and discourse. So again, what you need to do here is it's not about brainstorming where you sort of withhold judgment. Instead, what you see in these organizations is they know how to have very heated yet constructive debates because they get that they need that diversity and conflict. So one of the things we see is that the leaders of organizations that really are capable of this creative abrasion, they encourage the minority voice to be heard, the disruptors to be heard. Now, it doesn't mean that necessarily they're going to have a whole lot of influence each and every time, but they get that. The other thing you can see, and it's very important to do if you want to have an innovative organization, is to make sure that you let every voice count. So at Pixar, they say that everyone has a slice of genius. And what you as a leader need to do is to figure out how to unleash 
those slices of genius so that you, again, will have them to harness to figure out what needs to be figured out to make, you know, to make the movie. And one of the things that we see is that a lot of leaders aren't really comfortable with the kind of conflict and potentially chaos that you can have at moments when very talented, passionate people actually are, you know, arguing, if you will, or debating so that they can create that robust pipeline of ideas. So speaking of leaders, the leaders you examined seems no matter their business, they paid particular attention to making sure their organizations were able to do three key things. So share those three key things with us. So the first one was creative abrasion. And that is, again, being able to create a marketplace of ideas through debate and discourse. And the idea of marketplace is really an important one because it's a competition of ideas. So what you see in these organizations is not only do people know how to inquire and actively listen, they know how to advocate in constructive ways. And that's a very important piece to get the basic, you know, get that pipeline there so that you actually have ideas to work with. The second capability is creative agility. This is about how you test and refine that portfolio of ideas really through experimentation. So it really is about this discovery driven learning where you don't, you don't know where you're going by definition. If you're trying to do a, an innovation of some sort, you actually can't plan your way there. Instead, you have to act your way there. So I think this design thinking kind of approach that we're all learning a whole lot about is really critical to being able to innovate. So building that capability to do that is important. So as one of the organizations told us, we don't run pilots, we run experiments. Because when you run a pilot, it means if it doesn't work that someone was wrong or something was wrong. When you run an experiment, you're trying to learn. Now you try to run these experiments as rigorously and as fast as possible so you can learn very quickly and figure out you know, what is the proper solution. And if you're doing this right, you're often doing it with your client so when you come up with the solution, it's also almost, it's better prepared to be something that can be actually executed. And then the final capability is what is referred to as creative resolution. So it turns out that most innovative ideas are not totally new. They're often the combination of other old ideas or reconfiguration of ideas and using them to address a new opportunity or a new kind of problem. Well, unless you can do decision making that will allow you to do both and as opposed to either or decision making, you're never going to be able to come up with the kinds of innovations that you'd like to. So what we see in these organizations is that people are not willing to go along to get along. They don't compromise because that's the easier path. They don't allow one group to dominate. They don't allow the bosses to dominate. They don't allow the experts to dominate. And so consequently, what you get is more kind of opposable thinking and opposable decision making where you combine things as opposed to saying one, you know, one group is right and one group is wrong. Now, the title of your book, Linda, is Collective Genius. So I want to talk more about this type of collaboration and the coming together of minds so we can sort of deepen this idea, amplify any of the key ideas that you want people to remember six months from now and how to, how we can learn to recreate this collective genius inside our own organization. So deepen this idea for us a little bit. Okay, so one of the things that, you know, as you said, I'm a professor of leadership, and one of the issues that we face, and as I want to go back to saying this, is that too often people, when they think about leadership, think about being the visionary, that is, creating the vision, communicating that, and inspiring people to follow or execute that vision. Well, it turns out that really in people, when they're innovating, this doesn't work. As one of the leaders we studied said, you know, I don't even read books on leadership, because when you're really trying to do breakthrough innovation, you don't have a vision. You don't even know how you're going to get there, really. So you might have a vision initially to start some business, but you know what? If you keep relying on your own genius, your individual genius to keep that business going, never happens. What you have to do instead, like Ed Catmull, the, the founder of Pixar, said, what I need to do is create a world that people want to belong to. And the kinds of people I want to belong to our world are people who are very talented, very passionate, want to do the very, very best work, who have very bold ambition and have appetites that are bigger than their capabilities. So for sure, they're going to have to innovate come up with new and useful stuff to actually make one of these movies. So that's where he focuses attention, not on coming up with some vision, but rather how do I create an environment in which people will be willing and able to innovate? We just talked about the able. The willing has to do with the culture that you need to have in place to support, if you will, those, those capabilities. So I guess, again, going back to something I mentioned earlier, at Pixar, they say everybody has a slice of genius. All the organizations we looked at, um, they had some words like that. And I want to be clear, we were studying particular individuals in some of these organizations where we weren't studying, you know, all of Google or all of uh, one of the biotech companies we looked at, et cetera. We were looking at a particular business unit where this leader was there. And what that leader did is he or she understood, I'm the stage setter. I'm not the performer. And that can be hard for people because these people were all visionaries themselves. So I guess what I would want people to remember six months from now is, you know what? You may be a visionary, 
But that's not your role if it's about leading innovation. If you want to create an organization that's really good at innovative problem solving, you've got to focus on how do you help create an environment where other people will be willing and able to do this stuff because you can't simply rely on yourself to get this done. And the other thing we know is if people are really talented and passionate, they don't want to follow you anywhere. They don't want to follow your vision. That's not the, that's not the game they're there to play. As a matter of fact, two of the executives that we studied in Silicon Valley said, if I told people, you know, here's the vision, follow me, they, they would, they would go out into the parking lot and get into their cars and go work someplace else. They want to co-create the future, create those solutions with you. Mm, I like that. You are the stage setter and not the performer, and they don't follow you. They go to co-create with you. That's great. So you mentioned setting a, uh, a proper environment where people have psychological safety, but they also know what's required of them. Within many organizations, I mean, people aren't seemingly always incentivized to come together in a way that promotes collaboration and collective genius. Give us some advice on overcoming the hurdle of the mentality, hey, what's in it for me? Yeah, you know, I think many of us are beginning to understand if you want to do anything that's really important or useful, you can't do it by yourself. I mean, let's just face it. So one of the things we ended up having to study is it's not just about innovating sometimes within an organization. You often have to work, you know, across organizations. You see these private-private partnerships or private-public partnerships. So I think anything important or big where you're really going to have impact, and that's the kind of thing we were interested in looking at, you, you, just, you just don't do it alone. So just kind of face the facts about that. One of the other studies I was doing while I was doing this particular work with my, my co-authors was a project in South Africa. And I had the privilege of meeting Nelson Mandela, who very much believed that, you know what, leadership is about creating this environment where people who are nimble can actually go on ahead, where upon the others follow, everybody doesn't have the same size slice of genius. And you're directing from behind. So your role, again, is about creating that environment in which you're going to make sure you utilize all the talent in your organization. So one of the organizations I studied was a, an organization called Pentagram, one of the most prominent design firms, um, partnerships. It's been around for about 40 years, very prominent people who, you know, help build museums and things. And they all understood they're all rock stars. And they said, you know what? You need to be around other rock stars to continue to refine your own art and your own practice. I know I need that. I cannot do it by myself. So they sought out, and even though they all got paid, if you will, the same, the junior and the senior partners, they did that because they understood that unless they could abrade or really refine their ideas, be challenged by people who were as good as they were, they weren't going to do really fabulous work and be able to take on the kinds of big projects they wanted to take on. So you know what? If you want to work by yourself, you're going to do small stuff. If you really want to have impact, it's about building um, and working with others who are equally talented, equally passionate, who you're going to be willing to treat in some, some ways as equals to get this done. Mm. So, you know, one of the things I just want to say about this is so Steve Jobs is obviously someone we all read about. One of the things that happened when they finished Toy Story 2, which was a very difficult movie for them to get done, was they decided someone said, you know, let's pay a bonus to people who made this movie. Steve Jobs said, you know what, we're never going to pay bonuses to the people who, who made the movie. It takes about 250 people, four to five years to make one of those movies. He said, no, we have to give a bonus to the entire studio because it was the entire studio that actually allowed this thing to happen. And what they did, going back to the slice of genius notion, is that everyone got the equivalent of 13 weeks of whatever their salary was. So needless to say, the director's salary is higher, but you know he got 13 weeks. The person who made hamburgers got 13 weeks of whatever his salary was because Steve understood it was collaborative. It wasn't about, you know, one individual. It wasn't even about the people who made that one film or who were working directly on it. It's about the entire community. It takes a village to do truly breakthrough work. I want to go back to one of the concepts that you talked about uh, in the question before and this idea of we need structure and we need hierarchy. And even though we're talking about innovation being a collaborative effort, it still requires leaders. So explain the dichotomy between the need for multiple voices and then the requirement to still have one stand out in order to successfully innovate in an organization or a team. This dichotomy between the leader and the collective freedom collaborative process. Define that for us so that we know clearly how we need to be as the leaders and then, and then where the separating line is to make sure that we have freedom of collaboration. So one of the things, can I give you an example? Sure. And then we can back into So let me just describe to you how Bill, who was running the infrastructure group of Google, dealt with the fact that they needed to come up with a new way of saving data when they got YouTube. So when he heard that they were going to acquire YouTube and this was all going to go on, he went to his group of engineers and said, we're getting ready to acquire YouTube. We know it won't work. Or we, our website is not ready for that kind of service. So we need to figure out what to do about it. 
He did not say, you know, you people go solve this mission critical problem. Instead, he waited and allowed two groups to emerge spontaneously, as he put it, around solutions that they thought might work for what they needed to do with YouTube. He, he then let those two groups work full time uh, for two years, working, as he put it, at breakneck speed to come up with a solution to what they needed to do to the website to be able to really deal with YouTube. And what he did is made sure they built prototypes, bumped them up against reality to use his language, you know, talk to different service groups, talk to the group who was going to in the evening. Uh, if the if the website went became wobbly, they'd have their their beepers were going to go off in the middle of the night. Once they did all of that and discovered for themselves the limitations and the strengths of their different approaches, he felt they're learning along the way. This is sort of that creative agility. Then at some point they needed to make a choice because the website was getting too wobbly. So they made a choice. And at that moment, what he needed to make sure of is that they didn't lose the learning of the other group, quote, that lost, and that they actually made sure that learning was used, because that's what makes people crazy and frustrated. If I worked for two years and killed myself, and then my learning is lost. So he had two or three members of that team join the next generation team that was coming up with the next website solution. So this whole issue, the role of the leader there is really as a social architect. He's overlooking the whole process. He's not the one who's coming up with the new ideas. He's allowing for the others who actually have all these various ideas and approaches to deal with it to actually have an environment in which they can work together. And I will tell you that the engineers were very, uh, some of them were very upset about this initially because they had a shortage of engineering talent. And they said, isn't this, this is inefficient. And he said, you know what? A couple of things. One is innovation's hard and doesn't always work. And if I have two smart groups working on it, I've raised the probability that you know, we'll get a solution that will actually work. And frankly, you need to keep innovative teams at a human scale. So he, you know, keeping them the size they were with the two, and if you put them together and too prematurely, they probably would have focused on winning and losing as opposed to discovering what was the best solution or the better solution at that time for Google. So the role of, of Bill was critical in this. But again, he's outside of it managing, if you will, that environment, being the social architect. He's not the one in there, quote, driving what the solution is going to be. Is that distinction clearer now with that example? Yeah, it's beautiful. So I think, Linda, we've established why innovating is important. Uh, we've discussed the, the knowledge behind it. We've given them a clear understanding of what it looks like. Now I want to drill down into some action items that those listening can turn this audio off and go and start executing on. Let's assume that the goal of everyone listening is to create an unshakable environment of innovation in their organizations or teams. Give us the three most important things that we need to do to make this happen. Three most important things. The first thing is whenever we're talking about leadership, we're talking about using ourselves as an instrument to get things done. So you need to rethink or recast your understanding of what your role is as a leader. You are the stage setter, not the performer. The second thing you need to do is you need to think about, again, these these capabilities and how you can build them. And your actions and your words will really make a difference in whether or not people feel like you are serious about creating those capabilities. So one of the things that you have to do is, first off, you need to think about the values of the organization. Is there that bold ambition? Are they focused on learning and collaboration? Do people really feel responsible that they are, in fact, a part of a community? The second thing you need to worry about is really what are the kinds of norms or rules about how people treat each other and how they think? And so in terms of how people treat each other, really this issue of respect that you can see embedded in the examples I gave you is a real critical one. And if you as a leader don't behave in a respectful way of, to others, and you don't actually hold people accountable when they're not respectful of others, then don't be surprised if you don't have enough psychological safety to even get people to be willing to share their ideas. So I think that's another thing you want to worry about. What, you know, what are those rules about how we interact? We saw respect, trust, and influence. Respect is about saying that, you know what, everybody does have something to offer, slice of genius or whatever you want to call it. Second is trust, that is everyone is well-intended, and influence, everybody gets to have a voice, appropriately so. I think the other set of rules that we saw or norms that you had to pay attention to was how people thought about problems. Because innovation, it's about a, it's a kind of problem solving. And we saw there that you needed to focus on helping everybody understand and have the big picture of what they're about. So if you think that only some people need to have the big picture because only those people are going to be the innovators, guess what? You're not going to have an organization that's very innovative. You need to make sure that everybody in the organization, appropriately so, really has a big picture of what you're about, has a sense of shared purpose, that they understand what you're trying to get done and why it matters. And the other thing that you need to help them with is to help them actually develop 
really an understanding of how to advocate properly, that, that we really as an organization need to be very data-driven. We need to have evidence for our points of view. So again, there are very clear kinds of values and norms we see in these organizations, and you as a leader need to role model those and hold people accountable for living by them. And then when you do that, that gives you the foundation to be able to build those kinds of capabilities we talked about earlier. But it starts with you really rethinking what your role is. So as we wind down, I just want to be sure that uh, we are reaching everybody who's listening. And when we use examples like Pixar, Apple, Facebook, Zuckerberg, you know, the Elon Musks and Steve Jobs of the world, I, I'm afraid that people go, yeah, well, that's great for them. They have these large corporate organizations. And this sounds like a very corporate driven conversation. I want everybody out there to say, I can do this. Whether I have a team of three or I have a team of 30, I can do this and I need to do this. Speak to this thing that's going on in the minds of those that are listening right now, that this is not just about large corporate environments, that any small business, small team needs to learn how to incorporate this directly into their environment. Give them some suggestions on doing so and and make them sure that they say, yes, I can do this and need to do this. Well, you know, it's interesting that you should say that because mostly what people think is, quote, these large corporate environments are the ones that can't do this, that it's easier for startups. And I think I may have been a little bit, I may not have been as clear as I should have been in some instances. Some of these organizations we studied since they started up, right? Not, not once they were big. And so just to be clear. So as I said, the person we studied at Google was number eight or something employee there. The person, um, that we studied at a, at MCM, actually it's a rejuvenation of a brand, MCM. It's a Korean company run by a woman who, um, and there are not a lot of women who have very senior positions in Korea, who's basically has been able to take on Prada and all the other big luxury brands with a relatively small group of, of women mostly because she has run it the way we've been talking. We also looked at a woman who was creating for, um, Viacom, Nickelodeon Latin America. Now, obviously Viacom is a big corporation, but Nickelodeon Latin America was a complete sort of startup internally in this organization. And frankly, the environment around her wasn't so positive about her doing that because they weren't real excited about going into Latin America. So she was kind of in a negative environment for what she wanted to get done. And her bosses said, we don't believe in the way you're going about this, but guess what? She did it this way. Very, very successful. They ended up saying, you were right. We needed to really focus on creating that kind of environment that you described. You've picked certain people and get you have them working in ways that don't kind of fit the way the rest of us work. But you've, you've ended up building a big business for us, not only in Latin America, but it ended up being important for the Hispanic market here in the United States. If anything, the bigger the company, the harder it is to do some of this stuff because uh, human scale makes it easier. Because at the heart of what you really need for these innovative organizations, and I guess this is what I should have said, this is one of the three. As a leader, what you want to do is not so much provide people with a sense of direction in the sense of, you know, this is where we're going. What you want people to understand is who we are and why we're together, why our purpose together, our shared purpose makes it worth it for us to take on these challenges. So going back to that Nickelodeon Latin America situation, this again was early on because this is research we've been doing for a long while. What she said is children in Latin America deserve to have really high quality product. And we need to do this because it will make a difference in the lives of those children. And so for sure, I think what you as a leader can do, whatever your business, you know why you're starting your business and you know how much effort you're having to put into it and how much risks it entails. You need to be surrounded with people who really share in that sense of purpose about what you're doing. And for sure, as startups all know and entrepreneurs all know, where you thought you were going to go when you started the business, very different from where you end up usually. So it's not so much that you know, you you know, you have some ideas, but the direction and what you actually end up producing as a business, at least is, this is what I've seen when I've studied a lot of startups, is they end up in kind of a different place than they thought. So what holds them together is as they're making those moves is whether or not they have the sense of shared purpose, whether they have those capabilities, whether they can be agile, as we talked about, so that they can make the moves and really pay attention to what the market is saying to them so that they can adjust accordingly. So I I actually think it's easier for smaller, if you will, or younger organizations to get this stuff done than than larger or older organizations. That's what the that's what the research tells us too as well. So let's say that we've inspired everybody here today Linda to up their innovation practice. Let's say they want to be the chief innovation officer in their organization. What's one single mantra or philosophy, kind of like you're the stage setter, not the performer, or one behavior? Yeah. If they're to put something on the on a sticky note that they put on their computer screen to look at all day, every day, what, what's that one thing that you want them to keep in mind with and remember six months from now? Everybody has a slice of genius. 
And the reason why I want to recommend that they remember that is so often we don't believe that. Now, I teach at what is an elitist university where you think that, you know, some people are special, some people aren't. When you see organizations that can innovate a lot, what you see is that they hire hard to make sure that everybody who's in that organization is someone they respect that has something to offer. And if you deeply believe that, then you're going to treat people accordingly. If you don't believe that, you're not going to treat them that way. And guess what? Remove those people from your organization that you don't believe have a slice of genius. They're just going to keep you from getting done what you need to get done. So the first thing I think it's about the people who you hire and how you feel about them and believe in them. Don't bring in people in your organization that you don't think have a slice of genius. Second thing, don't bring in people in your organization who don't fit the kind of culture you're needing to develop and create to get this kind of innovation happening. Leave them out. Well, Linda, thank you so much for providing us with your genius here at Success and certainly all the genius knowledge that you have collected and shared with us in this conversation. Thank you so much for being with us today, Linda. Thank you. It's been my pleasure. If you are listening to this audio, then you are a self-starter, someone who sees the world and sees opportunities to make it better. You might not know it, but that also means you're an innovator. An innovator is defined as a person who introduces new methods, ideas, or products. You don't have to change the world to be a truly great innovator. Innovating to building your business is a powerful thing and a must if you want to survive and thrive. Our guest today couldn't agree more. He has started a movement that is transforming the way people innovate based on his book, The Lean Startup, how today's entrepreneurs use continuous innovation to create radically successful businesses. Eric Reese is an entrepreneur and author. He and his ideas have appeared in The Wall Street Journal, Harvard Business Review, Inc., Wired, and now, of course, Success Magazine. Eric, welcome to success. Great to have you here today. Hey, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. So innovation seems to be a mandate for all businesses in the 21st century. But give us the why behind this mandate. Why is innovation a must for any business nowadays? Well, I I don't think it's uh, controversial to say that we're living through uh, uh, times of unprecedented change. And, you know, uh, people who have focused on innovation and, and change and creating things that are new, you know, really know in their hearts that innovation is easy as long as you can predict the future. So everyone who feels like they know what's going to happen next in their business uh, is set and everything's fine. And I know a lot of people who started a business or went to join a business that they thought was in a pretty static and safe industry. Like I'm talking recently to some friends in the taxi cab business, you know, seemed like it was going to be the same forever, never change, nothing new. And then all of a sudden, next thing you know, there's radical disruption coming out of Silicon Valley coming after your business. And so... Uh, as that happens more and more, and as the underlying tools of change, the technological revolution, the software re- revolution, as that puts the means of production in more and more people's hands, then there's more and more uncertainty about the future. And uh, customers become increasingly demanding and fickle. And, and just basically, uh, for people who have an existing something, things become more difficult. For those who are trying to start something new, however, those, you know, uh, here in Silicon Valley and, and entrepreneurs around the world, uh, this is a golden age because that uncertainty creates unrivaled new opportunities. And those people who are able to adopt that mindset of continuous change or continuous innovation, uh, they are able to reap those opportunities and take advantage of the uncertainty instead of it just giving them heartburn. Yeah, I think this is the time of greatest opportunity we've ever seen in human history because of what you just described. Before we go on and talk more about innovation, let's make sure that um, everybody knows what innovation means because it has a pretty broad understanding. Define innovation for us. What should we think of when we hear the word during our conversation today? Sure. I mean, look, it's become quite the buzzword. And I know a lot of people think, uh, you know, I start to hear about innovation and change consultants and creativity and entrepreneurship like this, you know, corporate America goes through these fads where they get excited about some new idea and, and pretty much it becomes pretty soon it becomes ridiculous. So I think the easiest thing to do is to think about this uh, as a phenomenon of entrepreneurship. Like, w- what does it really mean to be a startup, to do something new, to be an entrepreneur, to be an innovator? Uh, in my book, I laid out what I think is the critical definition of a startup, which is a human institution designed to create something new under conditions of extreme uncertainty. So if you will, uh, innovation and entrepreneurship, this is the management discipline that deals with situations of high uncertainty. It just so happens to be in vogue at the moment because, as we've been talking about, we're living through times that that really define extreme uncertainty. 
So we often hear the word、uh, disruptive put together with innovation. Yeah. So ex- explain what disruptive innovation is and and how it might differ from the、uh, definition you just gave us when it just is just innovation. Sure.、Uh, disruptive innovation is is a really important concept. It was、uh, coined by a business school professor named Clay Christensen, and, and those who haven't read his great book, The Innovator's Dilemma, and the books he's written since then,、uh, they're really fantastic. And although disruption and disruptive, th- those those words have become a bit of buzzwords, and when you read them on the business press, people don't always use them correctly.、Uh, the core insight to the innovator's dilemma is that、uh, when you have a successful business. Already successful, and you have existing customers. It's natural to want to pretty much do what those customers say. So you you keep making your product better and better and better. Think about the old, you know,、uh, IBM mainframes before the PC, right? You you add more features, you give them more power, you make them more expensive, but also more valuable to customers. Disruptive innovation、uh, is what happens when someone comes up with something new and says, "Well, instead of making the existing thing a little bit better, I've got a completely new technology and completely new approach、uh, that, in a lot of ways, is worse than what came before." But for certain customers who maybe couldn't afford an IBM mainframe computer, then、uh, a PC, although it's not as good as a mainframe, it's also a lot cheaper.、Uh, that allows them to、uh, establish a foothold in what they call the bottom end, the low end of the market, and then start to make those products better and better and better until the disruptor. You know, becomes good enough to take over large parts of the market, and it's a phenomenon you see in industrial businesses and technology businesses, and and you know even in the world of apps and Silicon Valley.、Uh, it's just a, a a basic phenomenon that whenever we have an established safe incumbent, if someone can come up with a new and more rapidly improving technology, or or even just a different approach, different business model,、uh, they can displace a seemingly invincible incumbent. Just ask Nokia, BlackBerry, Microsoft. You pick pick your company that's been the victim of this, and.、Uh, You know, it just—it seems like it comes out of nowhere, and then all of a sudden,、uh, the mighty have fallen. So let let's get into the to the head of、uh, a great innovator. But don't model what they do because what they did to create their success, it, the the landscape might have changed. Instead, model how they think. So, how do great and truly fantastic innovators? Think. How, how can you teach people to think like a great innovator? This is a tricky question because in our society, in our culture, we so much believe we we almost put the great men, and they're almost always men of business, you know, and the great innovators up on a pedestal, and, and we make it seem like you're either born with the right stuff or you're not. And I think when you get inside the head of the great innovators, the thing that I admire the most is this very paradoxical combination of true commitment, absolute unwavering commitment to their long term vision. Coupled with this seemingly contradictory absolute flexibility about the best way to get there,、uh, and so when we talk about the need to pivot, almost every great startup, every great innovation, every great policy change, like it's very rare for someone to have an idea、uh, and then the reality of it to work out exactly the way they saw it in their head. Usually, what happens is you say, "Look, I, I want to get to a certain destination," and you make a route, you make a plan to get there. We call that the strategy. So. You know, I believe the best way、uh, to to get to my destination is to build a certain kind of product. And you know, pick your famous startups of today. Sometimes we forget what their first products look like. You know, in the movies, Facebook version one is already a success, but people forget about the predecessor, Face Mash, the dumb thing that Mark Zuckerberg was making in his dorm room to p- compare his classmates to farm animals and all kinds of other goofy stuff. That was an important part of the journey. The failure of those early prototypes. Helped him understand what ultimately the product was going to be. People forget that Google, before Google was、uh, what it is today, you know, the absolute advertising behemoth. The original Google business plan was they were going to make money selling search appliances, those little yellow boxes they would sell to corporations to help them search their corporate intranet. So when you go back in time and you look at the ideas that these innovators had, they often seem pretty stupid. In retrospect, you know, it's pretty dumb. Everything is easy if you already know the answer. But what happens is. When they encounter difficulty, when they say, "Oh, you know, it turns out customers are not going to buy those ye- little yellow boxes," or you know, "Hey, face match isn't the right approach," or you know, Groupon, when it was、uh, still called the Point, was、uh, you know, petition platform. You know, all these stories of the initial things not quite right. They don't just say, "Well, I'm going to give up and go home," but neither do they persevere the plane straight into the ground through stubbornness. They're able to you know, keep one foot rooted in what they believe and say, "But what have I learned from this experience, and how can I adjust, adapt?" Uh, change as we call a pivot into the next idea, and by doing that in a disciplined way,、uh, we believe that you can teach innovators to become more likely to succeed with their ideas. So I just want to be sure we don't leave any listeners behind as they hear the 
title of your book, um, Lean Startup, and they think, well, I've had a business for 10, 20 years. I've got this existing business. How does this apply to my existing business? So be sure that, uh, that, that we address that. Somebody's got a business. They've, they've been the incumbent um, winner in their market for the last 10, 15, 20 years. I think they're actually at more risk than, than the startup is. But explain how they need to be thinking about their business, even if they are already successful and they've been successful for a while. Yeah. Well, success breeds complacency. And as, and you know, and, and as I always say, as long as situation's not changing, as long as the context isn't changing, as long as your customers aren't changing, then everything's fine. You can just keep doing what you've been doing and you don't need to be a startup. I mean, a lot of people uh, listening now are probably, they were a startup many years ago, but they don't think of themselves still as a startup and that's totally natural. Uh, and yet, uh, if we want to create an institution of lasting value in a time of, of highly uncertain change, highly rapid change, then we're going to have to always be um, experimenting with what's new. So, so for example, I was with a uh, doing a workshop for a company, you know, established company, been around many years, very successful, uh, and several of the managers were were in my workshop, and we were talking about these very ideas. And one of the people finally said, "But uh, if we're the number one in our market, and we, you know, we have been around for many years, and we're and we're we're profitable quarter after quarter, and we're and everything's up and to the right." Do we really need to listen to to what you're saying? And I said, not really. If everything's fine, if you don't face disruption, then uh, no, you don't need to make any change. And he said, oh, good. And I said, but by the way, the theory of disruption says that in a lot of historical examples, because the disruptor comes in at the low end of the market and they steal your worst customers first, the last few years before you become completely irrelevant are often your most profitable, highest margin, fastest growing years ever. So if things are going absolutely great, it could be that you're in a steady state situation that's going to be fine forever, or it could be that you are in fact on the brink of extinction. So as long as you're sure which of those two scenarios you're in, then you don't need to worry and the workshop can end. And the, and the particular manager I was saying that to was kind of satisfied, like, okay, good, I think I'm set. But several of his colleagues were like, whoa, whoa, hold on, hold on, wait, say that again? Uh, and then they started to talk about, you know, it's funny you mentioned that because Although our market share is still excellent, among the lowest paying customers, our share has plummeted to kind of to zero and there's this new overseas competitor. And we started to have a real conversation about the fact that all of a sudden, actually, in certain segments, not only are they losing share, their share has gone to zero, but they don't really care because those are their lowest margin customers. And that is like the hallmark of a disruption situation. So uh, many of the people I work with now, you know, although I started in Silicon Valley, high tech startups, like you'd imagine, I, I spent a lot of time with uh, with existing companies now, including some of the world's largest companies, you know, companies like Intuit, GE, and Toyota, uh, as well as with a lot of small business, you know, where all of a sudden seemingly safe incumbents, you know, are, even if they're not in the process of being disrupted right this second, they're starting to worry about it. They're starting to see those possibilities and, and want to guard against that, that scenario unfolding in the future. Now, while I believe, you know, everybody in an organization is in sales, everybody is in customer service, they all are also, um, need to have the mindset of innovation. But if you have a, a big enough team, you talk about developing innovation teams who are dedicated to this thought process. And you're particular about how that uh, team needs to be put together. Maybe break down the structure of, of a great innovation team. What, what must they have to succeed? Yeah. People don't realize the advantage that true startups, you know, the Silicon Valley startups have over incumbents is that nobody cares what they do. They have nothing to lose. They got no customers, no nothing. It's just a completely new idea. So you got five people, you know, working together cross-functionally. There's no one telling them what to do. They have, they have complete freedom. And, and of course they have no customers. So nobody cares. So they have nothing to lose. They can't screw up. They make mistakes. It's not a big deal. They're able to learn really quickly. Uh, if incumbent organizations want to compete with that, then they have to develop the capability to have their own internal startups. And that doesn't mean, okay, well, we turn the whole company into a startup. I mean, I've done this with companies of 10, 100, 1,000, but also hundreds of thousands of employees. You can't turn a 100,000 employee company into a startup overnight. That's not feasible. What you want to do is say, look, but when we're trying to do something new, we want to have a team that's exploring a new possibility, a new concept. They need to have the right structure, a startup structure to get things done. And there's a couple things that I think are essential. One, got to be a cross-functional team. So most uh, established companies are, are um, organized in departmental silos. So you have the engineers, they work with other engineers, and they throw work over the wall to operations, or you have designers that throw the design over to engineering. You know, it's classic what we call waterfall development, where each, the work product flows from one department to the next. That way of working, you know, can work for established companies, but it is absolutely lethal for startups. You need 
uh, true cross-functional collaboration. So we got to have engineers and marketers and salespeople or whoever is going to be involved in the development of the product. They need to work together on a full-time basis. Amazon has this great concept they call the two pizza team. It's a it's a team that no larger than you can feed with two pizzas. And it's just a you know rule of thumb for saying, hey, you know, a small team, a five person team, an eight person team, that that really is the core work group that's going to get things done. So a cross-functional, dedicated, small team that has what we call a stake in the outcome. So it's not necessarily a financial stake, although that's extremely helpful. If you'll notice almost all the people in Silicon Valley who've become incredibly rich. Uh, have done so through equity ownership and the thing that they themselves were working on. And there's something really powerful about tying someone's compensation to the long-term performance of the thing that they create, where it's not possible to give people a financial incentive to uh, create an innovation, but we can give them a real sense of ownership over the outcome. So, uh, for example, a technique that's been used for many, many years at Toyota, when you create a new model car at Toyota, the person who is singularly responsible for that a uh, car is called the chief engineer. It's an individual person who has the moral authority to make every decision uh, that's going to be related to that car from, you know, how many passengers it's going to have to what the radio should look like. If anyone has a question, it's known within the company who to ask. And in fact, inside the company, they don't refer to it by its external model name, you know, like the Corolla or the Prius. They talk about the car as Mr. So-and-so's car. So it's actually named after the person who's responsible for it. So everyone in the organization creates kind of in, has an instant understanding of who's responsible and who who will be uh, who will reap the rewards if, the, if that product is successful and who will accept the blame if it's a failure it creates incredible accountability and incredible sense of ownership among the team to know that this is our car and if we're successful with this it's not going to be some remote executive who's going to take the credit we're going to get the credit we're going to be known within the organization as the people who made this work all right. So, um, you know, since quite a, a high number of startups fail, obviously that means innovation isn't easy. Share a few of the challenges that we might face as we work to innovate in our startup or our already thriving business. Yes. Failure and innovation are inextricably linked. And so people who think failure is not an option really have a hard time with this. And I, I like to joke, I've actually met people, operations managers and CEOs. And I've met people who literally have a mug on their desk. It says failure is not an option because in certain parts of our business, the parts that deal with operational efficiency, the safety, compliance, uh, customer satisfaction, we develop a playbook where excellence in the business is defined by following the playbook in a fastidious way. And we have confidence that if you do things right, that will yield a, a quality outcome. So high quality input yields a high quality output. And as soon as we start to work in the domain of startups, this way of thinking becomes really challenging. It's not that operational excellence is not important. It's just that high quality inputs don't guarantee high quality outputs. So you can have a perfectly engineered, uh, beautifully designed, absolutely elegant product that customers don't want. So even though you did everything right, it still doesn't lead to business outcomes because customers don't want you built the wrong product. So we need to have a new mug on our desk. And it's not failure is not an option, but it's I eat failure for breakfast. Right. I get used to the fact that most of the things we try in an innovation situation don't work. And that's OK as long as we learn from each one and we're able to pivot to the next one uh, that make the next one a slightly less failure. And hopefully by making things less fail, less fail, less fail, eventually we get our point. We get ourselves to the point of a success. That's really the, the number one challenge in most businesses, including small, small businesses, large. But I mean, I see this in companies of almost every size and shape. They are working really hard to develop a culture where we reward success and punish failure. So people think saying failure is not an option causes people to do their best work. But in my experience, uh, having that as a company philosophy causes people to hide their failures rather than to prevent them. So one of the recommendations to counteract this that, that I've had for a number of, of companies I've, I've done this with, where as part of your employee management, part of your you know, HR reviews, when you're talking to, your, to people about how their year was, we actually have a line in the review where it says, tell me about your productive failures this year. So we're not going to reward every kind of failure. We're going to say, but if a failure was really productive, if it helped us realize, hey, we should stop doing something because that could save us money. Or if the failure helped us learn and then eventually get to a success, that's a productive failure. That's actually a profitable way to spend time. And if we get every employee used to the idea that not only is that okay, but it's a requirement of your job. Someone who comes into your office at the end of the year and says, I didn't have any failures this year is either lying to your face 
or was so hyper conservative all year long that they're not the kind of person that's going to help you get to any kind of innovation. We want people who can be honest about their failures. And then you can say, okay, well, what did you do to contain the cost of the failure? Did you make a good plan so that if you failed, the consequences were not catastrophic? What did you do to maximize the learning we got from that failure? How did you improve uh, the amount of scientific or validated learning that that failure could give us? Those are the kind of questions that can foster that culture of innovation that we need. So besides Toyota that you already cited, uh, give us some examples of companies that excel at what you're talking about. So we have an example to look at when we get stuck down the road. Sure. Well, actually, every year we put on a lean startup conference here in San Francisco um, uh, every December. And we actually make the videos of those conferences free on web. You can you can Google for it. And so many of the companies that are presented, uh, you know, hot startups like Dropbox or Palantir, big companies like uh, GE or Intuit. Um, what we do is we ask people to present case studies of things that they've actually experienced failures, you know, really the, the behind the scenes, like true grit of what, what this was like. And if I had to pick one example that I'm particularly excited about lately, uh, the last two years of my life, I've been working with GE. I mean, really one of the biggest companies in the world on a program of lean startup that they call internally, it's called FastWorks. And you, you can, uh, you can Google for FastWorks. They've, they've talked about it publicly. You can see the video that I'm talking about at the conference uh, last year. What's cool about it is this is probably the largest deployment of lean startup ideas uh, in the whole world. You know, we have trained uh, thousands of their top managers, every one of their business CEOs. I mean, really, it is a company wide initiative uh, to tackle uh, the bureaucracy that is kind of inherent in having a company of that size and to help their internal startups be more successful. And what's so inspiring about it is that that's an environment that so many people believe there's really nothing you can do. It's bureaucratic. It's dogmatic. You know, it's, it's old. It's, you know, you're never going to have innovation in that kind of context. And yet uh, we have many, many, many stories that defy the, that stereotype to say, hey, actually, with the right structure, the right process, it is possible for even supposedly big company people uh, to innovate. And now I work with a lot of companies where I can just say, look, uh, if GE can do it, what's your excuse? Yeah, exactly. So, Eric, last question for you today. We've established a great basis of understanding um, the importance of innovation and some of the how as well as as you leave us today, share one single insight that you've learned as you've explored innovation and the lean startup that would not only encourage us to innovate in our businesses more, but also get us started on the right foot. You know, there's so many things to choose from. And I want to go back to something that I kind of glossed over in our conversation so far, which is if I could choose one mental model that I think you could kind of almost derive all the rest of this from and that really is essential for success in a modern business. It's to recognize that everything you're doing in a startup situation is an experiment. And and people, you know, unfortunately, when we start talking about being more scientific in our decision-making process, a lot of people who had a, a what I consider to be a bad science education as a kid kind of had some trauma of having to be in like a chemistry class where we were told to kind of do things in a rote and not very imaginative way. And we were told that is science. So sometimes people object to this idea, well, if things are an experiment, I would be more scientific. That doesn't sound like the kind of creative, dynamic, entrepreneurial thing I was looking for. Uh, In fact, I had one critic who once said that you couldn't make entrepreneurship into a science. If if entrepreneurship was a science, then anybody could do it. And I laughed when I saw that because I was like, gosh, you know, science is a science and almost nobody can do it. I mean, science, the way it's actually performed is one of the most creative pursuits that humanity has and the the greatest scientists of all time are some of the most creative people that have ever lived. So if we take seriously the idea that we want to be experimental, uh, what does that really mean? And I think what's exciting about it is one thing it means is getting really serious about saying, what is the hypothesis behind what I'm doing? Like, what do I think is going to happen in the future if I take this certain action? And, And I have been shocked in my travels all over modern capitalism. I have been truly shocked how often people in business are doing stuff, but they don't really know why. You know, they were told to do it by their boss. And you're like, well, how did your boss know it was a good idea? And it's like, well, he or she just knows. They're the boss. I don't know. Or it's just how we've always done it. We did it last year this way, so we continue to do it this way. It just is how it is. It, 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 there's an incredible amount of waste that's happening in, in our modern business. And, you know, we have... In, in today's companies, we have our most talented, brightest, most creative people on the planet doing this work. And to waste all that time and energy, I mean, I think it's an appalling, appalling waste of human potential. 
it's not really any individual person's fault. Everyone's doing their job the way that they were told. And yet the net result, the sum total is millions and millions and millions of person hours of time and energy being absolutely squandered. So that's what we as business leaders, as entrepreneurs, as CEOs, as managers, as policymakers, that's what we are confronted with. An enormous waste of human potential because the systems that we are building make it so. And the question we got to really ask ourselves is if we learn to be more experimental at the work that we do, is there a better way? And I really believe the answer is yes. Fantastic. Well, Eric Reese, it's, uh, it's been great to have you here, to have you push us to continually improve, continually to innovate and help us create radically successful businesses. Eric, thank you so much for stopping by and talking with us here at Success. It's really my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Hi, Darren Hardy here again. It has often been said that the best way to predict the future is to invent it. And continuing to invent your future is going to be essential to your future and the future of your business and its ultimate success or failure. As Eric said, innovation and entrepreneurship go hand in hand. Peter Diamandis said to me back when we had him on the cover in 2013, either you disrupt your product and company or someone else will. Standing still equals death. So, the responsibility of leading innovation, as Linda said, falls on the leader, you. You have to be the social architect of innovation in your organization. Again, not as the performer per se, but as the stage setter. It is your responsibility to create the culture, mindset, and environment where innovation can flourish. With all that in mind, let me give you eight practical steps that you can take to lead and integrate innovation into the ethos and daily practices of your organization. Here's number one. Get out of the conference room and get into the marketplace. Companies can fool themselves by thinking they can brainstorm their way to innovation. But that is how they create product abominations that no one ends up caring about or wants, except those people inside the conference room fighting for their novel idea. Or organizations tend to rely on desk research and expensive consultants to analyze markets and redraft their business plans on fancier paper with prettier covers. Instead, get yourself and your product design team into the marketplace. Make everyone attempt to sell, support, and customer service what your business produces. Get them face-to-face with the customer, their business, their problems, and needed solutions. They will be surprised to learn what matters and what doesn't matter when they actually get to know your customers in their environment and from their own words. And that leads us to number two, ask your customers. I know that sounds obvious, but you'd be surprised how most businesses fail to do the obvious. They are so busy studying every bleeding edge blog and every new shiny object heralded in the news or vendor product pitch that hits their desk that they become too distracted to simply ask the customer. Your customers won't help you invent the future, but they will help you improve on the present. They will give you plenty of ideas for incremental innovations and a litany of ideas for new features and requests for you to make your product cheaper, faster, and easier to use in different styles, colors, and sizes. But be careful. Most of these ideas will take you in the wrong direction. The key is to listen and choose the improvement ideas that will significantly move the needle on your sales and marketing adoption. Now with number two in your mind, here's an even better idea to layer on top. Number three, observe your customers. Often customers either don't know what they want or they idealize their suggestions, survey responses, and feedback notes. I'll give you a close and personal example of this. When we send out surveys to readers of this magazine, we ask people what they want to read about. What kind of articles and people do they want us to feature? The answers always come back to us as, we want to read about people just like us, people who are just starting out, or We want to read about people making a difference, having a societal impact and social entrepreneurship. No, you don't. Oh, I know that is what you say. But if we observe what you do, a very different story is told. If we put unrecognizable, unknown people on the cover of this magazine, you know, people just like you, you don't buy it. Or let's just say the marketplace doesn't buy it. 
if we put Richard Branson or Blake Shelton on the cover, then the issues fly off the newsstands. If we follow the most read, shared, and commented articles on success.com, they are the articles on business, wealth building, personal development, and, well, personal success. Not the making a difference, giving back, charity, or even social entrepreneurship stories. Now, we want to be more than just those narrow topics and people who are popular. So what do you do with this observation and data? Well, we meet the market where it's at. They like famous and well-known people that they are familiar with, and they like topics that will help them grow their business and make more money. Then through the Trojan horse of these well-known people and these topic categories, we can take you where we want you to go. We use Branson, Shelton, and others to get you inside the magazine. Then we use their stories, their successes and failures, and make their stories practical, relevant, and applicable to you, the small business owner, sole proprietor, or micro-entrepreneur. And once the magazine is in your hands and you're flipping through it, now we can also introduce you to ideas, topics, people, and businesses that are doing great work in the world that might inspire you in a way you might not have sought out, but now are struck by. So the lesson here is, number one, get into the marketplace. Number two, yes, ask your customers. But number three, and maybe most importantly, observe their behavior, not just their words. As Winston Churchill so famously said, I no longer listen to what people say. I just watch what they do. Behavior never lies. Key point, make a note of it. Okay, here's number four. Ask your staff. Oftentimes, discussions of innovation, strategy, and improvement, brainstorming, happens in the boardroom, the people furthest from the action. Instead, source your frontline team. They have the most information and interaction data to see opportunities for innovation. Often, they just need encouragement and a forum to bring their great ideas forward. Number five, analyze customer problems and complaints. When customers feel strongly enough to register complaints about any aspect of purchasing or using your product, you have great starting points for innovation. Always be looking to make your product easier to buy and to use by eliminating any inconveniences and introducing improvements that overcome previous complaints. Number six, transfer an idea. One of the best ways to innovate is to steal or <clears throat> let's just say borrow an idea that works elsewhere and apply it in your business. One of the greatest inventions of the industrial age was the assembly line, often attributed to Henry Ford. But Ford didn't invent the assembly line. He borrowed the idea from the meat processing industry. Ford saw the production line working in a meat packing plant and then applied it to the automobile industry. This transferred idea dramatically reduced assembly line times and costs and made the mass market automobile possible. I've told you the story before about how Apple was stumped on how to create the colorful, translucent, yet hard enough to be a computer shell casing of their innovative and breakthrough product, the iMac, in 1998. After repeated problems with spotting and streaking, the design team decided to go outside their industry and visit a candy factory, where they learned about mass production tenting processes. They borrowed that idea from candy manufacturing and brought it to electronics manufacturing. Thus, the iMac was made possible, and eventually the most valuable brand the world has ever known which might not have been possible if they didn't steal or borrow or transfer an idea from another industry into theirs. Number seven, while you're attempting to innovate, it is important to measure progress and learning, not outcomes. Since innovation is iterating on continual failure, and since you're trying to invent products and solutions you don't even have a business model for yet, Operational milestones and financial forecasts are unreliable at best. Instead, measure the process, not the outcome. Measure things like the number of customers your team interacts with or the speed at which you develop a prototype. Continually ask these questions. What did we learn? What do we still not know? What questions do we still need to ask? 
Keep focused on the process and progress without attachment to the results until it's time. And lastly, number eight, think big and start small. You want to have a vision for a better world that can ultimately be created by the use of your product or service. But a grand vision can also be daunting and paralyzing. This issue of success was themed, take a giant leap forward. The reality is, there are no giant leaps. Giant leaps are perceived when you see where one started and where they are now. It looks like a giant leap, but in between were all the little steps. What looks like the thousand mile leap began by leaning forward and taking that first single step. Let me give you an example. When Larry Page, founder of Google, conceived of the idea to create Google Books, effectively digitizing the world's books and making them available online, everyone thought he was crazy. It was a big idea that Larry had in his head for a long time but never acted on. The giant leap, as it's perceived now, having over 10 million books scanned and available online, was started when Larry stopped dreaming about the idea and stopped listening to everyone who said it was too big and too crazy to even try. Larry went down to the store and bought himself a scanner and hooked it up in his office. He began scanning pages and timed how long it took him. Then he ran the math and realized that, in fact, it would be possible to bring the world's books online. One scan at a time. And it started with a single scan. I like how fashion mogul Mark Jacobs put it. Innovation is an evolutionary process, so it's not necessary to be radical all the time. So there you have it. Eight practical ways to execute and integrate innovation into your business. If you were driving or mobile while listening to this and want these tips in written form so that you can review them and act on them, which is my desire for you, then during the month that this issue is on newsstands, go to darrenhardy.success.com and I will post these eight steps on my blog. That's darrenhardy.success.com. While you're there, be sure to register for email updates so that when new posts are published, it will be sent to you directly. It's the best way to stay up on new and innovative ideas, evolutionary and radical. All right. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this issue of the Success Magazine CD. I hope you learned something new or were reminded of something you will now use. So now go out and be a shining example of success at work, at home, and in your community. And I'll meet you right back here in the next issue of the Success Magazine CD to guide you further as we journey together along the never-ending search for the best within you. Until then, I wish you great success. To learn how to share success with your friends and business associates, visit success.com. While you're there, sign up to receive the free newsletter, Seeds of Success, to get great ideas, inspiration, and quotes delivered to your inbox every week. Success Magazine Audio, copyright 2015 by Success, all rights reserved.